The loudest, the biggest, the brashest. New York is its own character in every play. The bad thing about New York is the pressure. You're always under pressure. Here are the stories about those plays. It's New York Accent with Damon Amendolara. Welcome to the latest installment of New York Accent. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Our next guest is a longtime member of the Red Bulls. In fact, he's really a Red Bulls lifer. He's been with the team since 2012, the only MLS team he's ever known, and he's a native New Yorker, so he's got great stories and context of playing here in the city. Joining us here on the show from the Red Bulls is keeper Ryan Mira. Ryan, how you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. My pleasure. Let's start at the beginning. You're from the Crestwood neighborhood of Yonkers, so not far outside of the city. You're growing up in the 90s. What is what's your childhood like when you're when you're growing up in Crestwood? Uh, It's great. You know, it was so nice. Uh, Yonkers, I feel, is a great spot to grow up. And and Crestwood's such a good neighborhood within Yonkers. And, you know, being so close to the city, but, you know, being a little outside, you got a little more room to operate. And as a kid, um, you know, that's all you want, just room to run around and get in some trouble. And unfortunately, I'm a Met fan. So growing up in the 90s, watching the Yankees win was tough. Uh, and it has been tough still since as a Met fan. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, I feel very fortunate to have grown up in, in Yonkers. And, uh, you know, it's a great place to grow up. I still live there to this day. I share your pain as a Mets fan. I'm a little bit older than you, but yes, in high school, watching Yankees fans celebrate all of those World Series championships Mm -hmm. was never easy. Now, you grow up in the 90s. The Red Bulls begin in 96 as the Metro Stars. Are you aware of MLS as you're a kid? Are you aware of the Metro Stars, then the Red Bulls? Oh, yeah. I used to go to some uh, Metro Stars games at the old Giant Stadium uh, with my dad and my brothers, and it's so cool to see how far – uh, not only the league has come since I was a kid, say, you know, I'm 32 now, so say 20 years ago, um, and, and just soccer in America in general has come because you couldn't really uh, find the games on TV. You had to really know when exactly they were going to be on. There was no real coverage. And to see, you know, now I'm in my 12th year here uh, with the Red Bulls to see how far it's come. And, uh, you know, we go to some stadiums, we get, you know, play in front of 50, 60,000 in Atlanta and, Charlotte, different places. So it's really cool to see the growth. And, you know, it's exciting what it will be, you know, say 10, 20 years from now. I assume you were a Tony Miola fan? Oh, yeah. Tony Miola. And then I remember more Tim Howard when I was really getting into it. Um, and then watching him go to Manchester United and Everton and then with the national team. He was a uh, guy I really looked up to and got the chance to play against uh, his last year here with uh, Colorado. American soccer has always been a great place, a birthplace of great goalkeeping. Tim Howard's one of those guys, but Casey Keller, go down the list. I mean, we, we've created a lot of great keepers before we, we had any other type of soccer stars going across seas, like your former teammate Tyler Adams. What do you think it is about the American keeper that has translated so well overseas over the years? Well, I think it's just the natural tendency of every American kid. You're going to pick up a ball before you kick a ball. That's just how we're raised. And, you know, I, I think uh, speaking for myself, it, it always came a little easier to me uh, because I had a background. I played basketball, baseball growing up. Those were kind of my two major sports uh, growing up. And then I played soccer like every other kid did. And uh, my coach just threw me in goal one day, I guess, because the goalie didn't show up or whatever. And It just stuck because I think I had that background in the other sports where you're using your hands more. So uh, I definitely think that's a huge reason why American keepers have had success. Uh, And it's great. It's put American soccer on the map, uh, you know, years ago when when we really didn't have that footprint in Europe. What do you remember about old Giant Stadium and Metro Stars games? What are the memories that you have driving to that huge gargantuan facility and watching some soccer? Ah, just the turf. Even as a young kid, I remember thinking, man, that looks like it's got to hurt to land on (laughs) it. I watched the boys diving and landing. Oh, it looked looked brutal. So luckily that's come and gone. Um, But it was fun. You know, we tailgate and, uh, you know, we get a good crew out there. I'll I'll only probably go to a game or two a year. Um, But it was fun. I I loved it, you know. And then to now be playing for the team is, I still pinch myself sometimes. Yeah, it's got to be wild. We'll get to that coming up here in a few minutes, but you have a really 
impactful, formative moment when you're growing up and 9-11 happens. I mean, that, that affected everybody on a really personal level here in the New York City area. I had graduated college just the May before, so I had moved back home. I hadn't had a job. And, you know, I, I grew up in Warwick, New York, which is in Orange County. So, you know, about an hour and change outside of the city. And, you know, family members that lived in New York and your dad, Jack, has been a longtime firefighter in the Bronx. And on that day, as we all know, uh, you know, the, the, the first responders were called to duty. What what is that like that morning of of 9-11 and you're in sixth grade and, and you go into school that day, right? Yeah, we were in school. And I remember like an hour into the day, uh, the principal came around to each classroom um, and kids slowly started leaving school. And they wouldn't tell us why. I think because there was a lot of people from the neighborhood who worked down there. Um, and kids had parents, aunts and uncles uh, that were down there. And um, at first we were excited. We, everyone's leaving school. We're like, this is amazing. And then I remember getting to the front office and my mom was there to pick me and my brothers up. Uh, and she had tears in her eyes, said there had been an accident, you know, planes hit the World Trade Center. Um, you know, obviously we didn't know exactly in the moment what was really going on. Um, but I remember I had that sinking feeling in my stomach, just seeing my mom and seeing uh, how distraught she was. And she told me my dad was okay. Uh, and my uncle who was a, a fireman in, in Midtown was okay. He was off that morning. His whole, his whole firehouse got wiped out down there. And, um, it was just a scary day. I think I was old enough. You know, I was 10 years old. I was old enough to know something terrible was happening, but I was too young to really understand it all, you know, a terrorist attack, you know, we grew up in America, this, these things don't happen here. You know, that's, that's what you think. And uh, so, you know, when something like that does happen, of course, uh, it's absolutely catastrophic. And we knew a lot of people, my dad probably knew 100 over 100 guys that have that died on that day. And um, so it, it's, it's scary. It's, it's hard to believe it's 20 plus years gone since then, you know, it, it definitely is. That morning, your dad's company does not get sent down to the trade center, correct? They knew that something really bad was was going on early. And so they held your dad's company back in the Bronx. Yeah, from my understanding, they held most of the companies uh, from the Bronx back just because they needed some uh, some companies kind of on standby. We didn't know they didn't know what else was coming. You know, so many rumors that day that there's more planes, this and that. So. Uh, luckily, they didn't go down there. Um, I think my dad got down there either later that night or the next morning to help with the with the recovery. Um, and then he was down there. We didn't see him for he was four or five days then. And it was kind of before cell phones, really. Um, and I remember he finally called the house and checked in and we were so happy to just hear his voice. And then he came home, you know, say a day or two later, finally. And I just remember going through the him and my mom going through the list of names of of people, uh, firemen that we knew that died or were missing at the time. Um, and it really just hit home then just how real it was. And, uh, you know, the amount of lives that, that were lost. You had actual dreams or, or beliefs that you, you could have been a firefighter. You would have been a firefighter. Did nine 11 cause you to rethink that or did it make you want to do it even more? Um, that's a good question. No, I never, it didn't really, I don't think impact me one way or the other. Uh, you know, as a kid, I grew up going to the firehouse and, um, you know, it was like a big playground for us going on the trucks and down the poles and this and that. And, and more so than anything, I think seeing the relationship and the bond that the guys have, um, you know, those guys that my dad worked with were superheroes to me and my brothers. They still are almost, you know, to this day. And, kind of larger than life characters and um just always kind of felt that my dad was going to be okay because he had all these guys who were you know the biggest strongest guys around protecting him you know so that's what he always told us when we were young don't don't worry about me you know think these guys would never let something happen to me and i, I think just seeing that bond and how much my dad loves the job he's still he's 63 i think he's got 41 years on the job and he should have retired years ago but he loves it and he's still he's still working and uh, I think he, he enjoys it now more than ever. So seeing seeing that, I think most people are dying to retire. He's kind of dreading the day that he has to retire. I don't think there's many <laughs> jobs like that. 
Yeah, it says a lot. It says a lot about the camaraderie and the passion for the job that that your dad is so is so committed to it. How how is your dad on 9-11 when the anniversary rolls around every year? Uh, yeah, they, they always do a mass uh, in the Bronx at, at one of the firehouses there. Um, you know, I think it's as the years have gone on, it's still a solemn day, uh, you know, but I think it's kind of they try to celebrate the lives of the guys and everyone that was lost um, more so now, you know, uh, it, it's it's never an easy day. Um, but, you know, I, I think uh, they try to just come together and that's what they're so good at. They kind of pick up the pieces and and uh, and, and stick together in the toughest of moments. And, and the crazy thing is there's more guys dying every couple of weeks from from 9-11 related cancers. I feel like my dad's going to a funeral once, twice a month to this day. So, you know, they're definitely still feeling the, the, the after effects of it all still. The firefighters, the police officers, the first responders, everybody that, that flew to help New Yorkers in that moment deserve a lifetime of adulation. It is, it's just, it's very poignant to be around here. And, and in my town, we had a number of lives lost because of those towers coming down and, and the things that you're mentioning as well, still affecting those. So it's, it's a powerful and impactful event. You are a New Yorker through and through. I mean, you grow up in Yonkers, you go to Fordham Prep, you attend Fordham University, you're drafted by the the Red Bulls, you've played your entire career for the Red Bulls. So what? how deep does the, the DNA of being a New Yorker and your dad a firefighter, your uncle a firefighter, how, how deep is that DNA within you of being from New York? Yeah, I love it. You know, I, for me... New York's the best place, you know. It's funny within the team, most got majority of guys, you know, from when they're say 16, 17, they go away to college, or some of the foreign guys just start playing uh, wherever and they bounce around their whole career. Um, and then when they're done playing, maybe they go home to where they grew up and you know, with their families and start a life. For me, it's the opposite. I've I've never had to leave. Um and as I've gotten older and I have a son now of my own, I, it's so amazing uh, to be able to be so close to family and friends. You know, you can't put a price on that. And and having all my family and friends be able to come to so many games over the years, uh, just so many good memories, you know, um, and, and it'd be hard to leave. I'll tell you that. It'd be really hard to leave. You know, I, I would miss the pizza. That's for sure. <laughs> What's your favorite slice? Uh, so I was being at Fordham, we went to Pugsley's all the time, right off Fordham road. And I mean, you couldn't go wrong down there on Arthur Avenue, but, oh, but that was, the best. that was the best. Yeah. If I sat you down on Arthur Avenue, I said, okay, Ryan, I'm paying. Okay. You can eat as much as you want. There's no game day tomorrow. We're going to carbo load for the night or whatever. Where, where are we, where are we going and what are you eating? Oh man, that's tough, man. Um, I'd say, uh, Tino's. Uh, on Arthur Ave, get a nice chicken parm, some pasta, do it right. I love that. A little, a little red wine if there's no game or practice, you know. Very nice. Yes, of course. Of course, if there's no game or practice. Yeah. So you grow up a Mets fan and you're that close to the Bronx, and then you attend college in the Bronx, and that's a stone's throw away from from Yankee Stadium. That must have been tough. Had to be a lot of Yankee fans taunting you in your life. Yeah, I mean, the majority of kids from my neighborhood were, were Yankee fans. So, like I said, growing up in those – you know, the dynasty years with Jeter and Torrey and all them, uh, it was really tough. So uh, I'm just dying for when the Mets eventually do win a World Series. That parade will be something else. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be the party to end all parties. When it finally yeah. happens, I'm going to tell you, I think <laughs> there's going to be a lot. There, I mean, the party's going to go <laughs> on for like a full week, I would imagine. You know, people oh, won't yeah. sleep. They'll just be partying all night long and it'll just roll one night into the next. I don't know. If if hopefully it's going to be October, so maybe early November, you might have a game. But we got to get we got to make sure that you're part of the the festivities as well when it happens. Yeah, we'll, we'll find some time. We'll find some time. <laughs> How is it to walk out into Red Bull Arena and play there? I mean, this is a top notch facility, internationally renowned. It's a soccer only facility, and it's just it's spectacular, and and the grass is gorgeous, and the whole thing is just wonderful. What's What's that like to know that's now in, in part of the New York sports landscape? Yeah, it's so cool. Um, 
you know, to come to this amazing stadium, we get to call this place home. I think we're a little spoiled because for me, uh, this is one of the best, if not the best soccer stadium in, in the country. Um, so to be able to call this home, we're incredibly fortunate. We get an amazing group of fans that come and support us through thick and thin. Um, and each time you walk out, uh, you know, for warm ups or for the start of the game, you know, I, I at least as I've gotten a little older, I try to take it all in a little more and, you know, I get to live my dream, kick a ball for a living. It, it's hard to beat that and do it in front of uh, my family and friends uh, in a market like New York where it doesn't get better than that. So, yeah, we're lucky, man. And we yeah, we just the next step is to bring a title here. And, you know, we think uh, we think we, we can do it. You know, it takes a lot of work and, uh, you know, we got to turn things around right now the way our season is going. But we're confident we got the guys that could do it. The fans have always been amazing, but there is that New York angst of when's the championship going to happen? The Red Bulls have had some great teams, had some amazing regular seasons, have some some deep runs in the playoffs, but it's never been a title. How hard is that for you growing up as a fan of the organization to to know that those fans are still dying and there's been you've come so close, but not quite have won the whole thing yet? Yeah, listen, like I. I'm a New York sports fan myself. I know how critical and tough I am on the teams that I root for and the guys on those teams. So, yeah, listen, it's it's not fun to uh, when the fans are giving you a hard time. But like I always say, I'd always rather that. That means they care. You know, if if they show no reaction, win or loss, like they're probably not that into it. And uh and our fans, they definitely care because they let us know when we're struggling. Like, you know, right now we're going through a tough, tough uh, stretch. And But that's New York for you. You know, I don't think there's a better place to win. You look at guys on other teams who have won here in New York and other sports and they're legends forever. So, um, listen, it's a tough place to lose, but it's the best place to win. That's how I look at it. It's a great way to put it. And, you know, that intensity – it means everything matters just a little bit more. So how do how do your teammates handle coming into the New York market and trying to navigate traffic or the size of the city or the intensity of fans and things like that? Is Have you noticed that it's a little bit hard for some of the guys to, to totally immerse themselves in it? I think the traffic's a big one. You know, we <laughs> yeah. got a, I think it's like a hundred bucks if you're if you're late to to training or a meeting or whatever. So the fine pot we put it towards end of the year party. The fine pot grows every year with with more and more new guys that show up. Uh, not used to it, but I think other than that, we we do uh, try to do a good job of just keeping the noise on the outside. You know, controlling what we can control within the locker room within our walls, um, because that it, it can only distract you the noise, whether it's good or bad, you know, it's just as uh, detrimental, I think, to listen when things are going well and everyone wants to anoint you as the best thing ever, the best team ever. I think that can hurt you just as much as listening to the negative stuff. So through the course of the season, we always try and preach just, you know, try and cancel out any any outside noise. Let's focus on what we need to focus on. And, and uh, you know, it's it's like the boring cliche answer, but take it one day and one game at a time. Soccer fans know how beautiful that that stadium is, that facility. If you haven't been to a Red Bulls game, I highly encourage you to do so because it's just a great sports experience. It's a great New York experience. And again, the facility, the sight lines are amazing. The facility is great. I just love it over there. Ryan Mira is a lifetime New Yorker, and he's a member of the New York Red Bulls and has been there his entire career, more than a decade, and has Spent some time with us here on New York Accent, the audio version of the podcast available all places that you get your podcasts, the video version available on YouTube under the WFAN channel. Ryan, this was a lot of fun, man. Thanks so much. Good luck the rest of the season. Awesome. Great talking to you. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoy New York Accent, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more episodes like this one. Also, if you want to watch more episodes of New York Accent, check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Thanks again for watching, and we will see you for the next episode of New York Accent.